Street Cred Sports. Street Cred Sports. Uh, I'm crossing over. I'm crossing over. I'm Euro stepping. Hello, this is Keenan of Street Cred Sports Training, and welcome to another episode of Time to Ball. This is episode 70. Uh, I know I missed a week. Apologies. Had some uh, stuff I need to take care of. Got to keep my health uh, in check. Had a uh, kidney stone. If you never had one, man, I hope you don't get one. They are painful. So I need need to look into some stuff. And then the missus gave me a cold, which you might kind of still hear, but it's, it's, it's on the downside. So I'm just trucking along. I hope all of y'all are feeling well. Uh, Today marks a Juneteenth celebration, and if you're not sure of what Juneteenth is, Juneteenth is when Texas found out that uh, slaves were actually free. Now, you know, growing up, it's always been something in, in Texas, so there are a lot of people that didn't know what Juneteenth was until, I don't say, maybe the last five to ten years you know, that it was more on the national scene, and now it's a federal holiday. And people that will come from out of, you know, that you meet or run into that be out of town, like, man, what is what is Juneteenth? Why is Juneteenth, you know, and stuff? So you, you kind of explain it to them. And the way it was always explained to me was, okay, so the Emancipation Proclamation was signed by President Abraham Lincoln. Now, this was to say that, hey, all the free, all the uh, slaves are free. You know, they, uh, the North won Civil War. There's no more slavery. It's abolished, right? So he signed that in January of 1863. Now, for apparent reasons, everybody understand that there was no internet, <laughs> you know, no social media where you could just type it in and everybody knows instantly. So it had to pass through. You know, words, telegrams, however, you know, everything reached. Well, in Texas, it wasn't it wasn't officially reached in Texas until uh, the army uh, came up on on the beach. I think it was in Galveston and announced that, hey, you know, there is no more war. There is no more slavery. You know, the slaves are free. Well, that, I mean, that's like that's really cool, but. It, it took t- over two years. <laughs> so he signed it on January 1st, 1863. Texas didn't find out about it until June 19th, 1865, right? So, like, <laughs> my whole man would, would, you know, look, sometimes you kind of joke about things. And, and I, I'm going to talk, talk regular. Sometimes you joke about things that are fucked up, right? But it's just because that's kind of how you have, that's kind of how you rationalize and deal with it. Like, you laughing, but you saying to yourself, man, that's messed up. So it's like, Texas knew, and they like, yo, shh, don't say nothing. <laughs> Be quiet. Everything is, is normal. We know that, that everything has changed, but we ain't going to let nobody else know. Keep them working. Keep everything going the way it's supposed to. You know, so everybody's just handling business, going about their lives and stuff until somebody come and tell us, hey, man, y'all are free. Oh, what? Yeah, we you free. Oh, that's great. All right. It's like, yeah, but y'all been free for two over two years. <laughs> Didn't nobody tell you? Huh? Like, no. Nah. You know, and, and you know. They're probably kind of scratching their heads like, damn, I, why couldn't he just say that they were free, man? Why do you have to tell them that it's been two years? Like, yeah, we decided to get two more years out of work for y'all. So that was all, that's always been the running joke. And it's, it's atrocious. I mean, I know I'm saying it and I'm chuckling about it, but it's like, how do y'all let people go two years and they're free and they, in two years they still thinking, that they slaves. Could you imagine now, you know, something like that happened? Boom. Social media. Oh, we find out right now. Breaking news. Oh, man, we free. Yeah, now we free the same day everybody else was free. So it's been a Texas thing. <laughs> it's been a Texas thing. And that's why Texas celebrates it. Uh, because that was uh, officially uh, our, you know, 
coming to the world party. We were late. So if you wonder, you always hear the term, like, you know, man, why is it that, like, black people be late to stuff? Well, <laughs> people in Texas, <laughs> we was late to finding out that we were free. So that's kind of how it is. It's like, yeah, bro, we was late. We, we didn't find out we were, uh, we didn't find out we were free for two years. So we could be late to this party that's coming over. <laughs> Oh my God. So, so yeah, I've explained that to people and people who I've explained it to throughout the years, like when I first came up here and I was in Utah, you know, and obviously you meet people, um, uh, throughout the country. So, you know, you tell, you tell somebody <clears throat> from like Chicago or, or from Florida or, you know, California or something, you know, some other part and you're telling them and you tell the story and they just kind of stare and they're like, Man, that's fucked up. <laughs> like, yo, they didn't tell y'all for two years? Like, yeah, we didn't find out for two years. So that's why we celebrate. We don't celebrate the January 1st, 1863. Here in Texas, we, we celebrate Juneteenth uh, from from 1865. So, uh, you know, I, I it's historical. And I try to keep, you know, everything just on a lighter note about sports. Uh, but the wife gets on me sometimes, you know, you need to let people know certain things, you know, so I'll, I'll tackle certain things here and there. I just, I don't try to, I don't want to try to be some political show, you know, where I'm uh, all of a sudden I'm a conservative person or all of a sudden I'm a, I'm a person from the left and all of my sports views and talk is all about this one. Now I try to be balanced, man. Cause I know. Not everybody on the left is some, a lot of the stuff on the left is full of shit. A lot of the stuff on the right is full of shit, you know? So you have to just kind of hold, you know, what you, what you value and you're not going to agree with everybody. You know, you just try to find common ground, but, but yeah, nah, that's, that's Juneteenth in a nutshell. You know, you can, you can, you can read, research and read. There are some articles out there about certain things and it's like, Yo, <laughs> it's like for real. I mean, could you imagine that? They're like, shh, don't say nothing. Well, oh, damn. You know they're they're finding out. The slave masters are finding out, and you know the slaves are over there working. And the and flight slave man, hey, you what? What pet telegram? Like, oh shit. Hey, don't say nothing. Don't say nothing. Just 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 go back out. Keep working. We're gonna act like everything normal, right? And then when they come in, they come on the beach, when the army comes on the beach and tells everybody, hey, you free. The flame out. It's like, damn, why couldn't y'all, why couldn't y'all lock the gate on the beach, man? Why y'all have to let the army get up on the beach? Man, we couldn't stop the army from getting on the beach. They the army. Okay, all right, all right, let's just play it off. Like, oh, hooray, all right, hooray, we gonna let y'all look. Yeah, man, y'all knew. Y'all knew, so. All right, let me get into, let me get into what, um. Uh, what interests me today. Uh, let me start out by talking about Boston winning. Congratulations. Boston wins the NBA finals, uh, five games. So, uh, I have for one, I didn't really know, like, you know, if they would win in four or five, six or seven, I knew I, I had said Boston would win. I had said, I didn't trust them, but I figured they were the best team and you know, they would win. Uh, and they did. Now, my key, there are always lots of keys. There are a lot of different things uh, that if you dissect film throughout a series, play by play, you know, quarter by quarter and stuff like that, you're going to find different things that um, you can say was the key. The only thing I had said throughout the playoffs was Boston has the ability, one through five, to make you play defense. And if all five of your defenders or your team, if there are some that can't play defense, they will expose it because everybody can 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 drive, shoot, and pass. I mean, in the literal sense, where they are a threat to hit you for 15 to 20 points. And then you have two guys that could score 40-plus uh, in a game. Now, my only thing that I said was that they was going to make Luka play D. And they did. And I felt that was the series, the key to the series. Luka looked tired in a lot of those games. Third, fourth quarter. Because he was getting picked up full court. And then on defense, they were, 
you know, running screens, uh, and and he was having to guard the 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 person off the screen. They were hunting for him, or when they were swinging the ball, it would get swung uh, at his at the person he was guarding. He'd have to close out, and they'd have to attack. And because he wasn't really, you know, committed defensively, they were able to get by him really quickly, and that put a lot of pressure on on the uh, other help side defenders to to rotate and stuff. Now, Boston didn't shoot good from the three for this series. They they made enough, but this wasn't a typical – they they missed a lot of shots, now, and, and they were wide open shots. So it could have been worse. Uh, now, obviously, the Mavs missed shots as well, but the Mavs were missing shots from guys that you don't expect to, to, to hit threes. Everybody on Boston – can shoot I mean it's statistically there they can shoot now by making them play defense you tire them out you make them play both sides of the court Luca doesn't like to play both sides of the court so to me that was the telltale sign and I tried to uh explain this to people I actually you know I have a friend I played uh high school with and he you know was talking to him about the game and he was like oh no man no Man, they not going to be able to do nothing with them mouths, man. With Gafford and, and Lively and, you know, those boys going to eat them up. And my thought was, yeah, but they're going to have to defend like they haven't. Because they haven't had to defend that way uh, the whole playoffs. They haven't. They, they were able to uh, rest because when they played the Clippers, Clippers didn't have five guys that could shoot threes. OKC didn't have five guys that could shoot threes that were a threat. Now, there's a difference between shoot the three and being a legitimate threat, right? Clippers Clippers didn't have it. Uh, OKC didn't have it. Obviously, Minnesota didn't have it, but this team had it. So it made it hard for them to defend, and it showed. Uh, but, again, I didn't think it would be – five get four five games you know I thought it might I, I'm not gonna say what I thought I actually I, I thought it would have I knew I felt it would be a little bit more competitive like closer games I just felt like in the end Boston was going to win because you know Dallas was gonna have a hard time stopping him and then uh, uh Boston defends very well so they took a lot of things away that that Dallas liked to do now speaking of that uh, the noise around Luca is getting louder, right? You know, so now people are questioning his leadership quality, qualities, his defense, you know, other stuff like that. For me, I feel I feel he he's got to get better defensively. Now he doesn't have to be all defensive, second team defensive. He just needs to be a guy that they're not trying to purposely hunt over and over and over again. And even if they do hunt him. Over and over and over again, they're meeting more resistance. He showed in game four that he could, if he's committed, he could play pretty good defense. <laughs> right? Now, that game was over. So, for a whole 48-minute, 82-game season into playoffs, can you do it? You know, defense is more desire and will. <laughs> right? So, uh, I don't know. But, like, I, I think about it with Steph. When Steph... What when they were starting to ascend, teams attacked Steph because obviously he was a guard, so he was smaller with with switches and stuff. But they went at him because he wasn't known to be a defensive uh, specialist. But he got better. Now is I, I don't know if he's ever made an all defensive team. He was high in steals. I know I don't know if he led the league, but I don't think he led the league. But he was probably in the top ten in steals. But at the same time, he was um, he's gotten really good playing defensively to where you don't see them trying to hunt him, hunt, hunt him, not haunt him, hunt him on, on uh, offense and pick and rolls as much as they, they used to. OK, um, so that's one area I feel he needs to obviously leadership qualities, being in shape, you know, uh, commanding respect, showing them that you're, you know, hey, I'm not going to ask you anything 
that I'm not willing to do kind of stuff. Getting on guys, holding them accountable, getting on himself, you know, not talking to the refs as much, those kind of things. Uh, the other thing is I think he should play off the ball more. You know, um, he needs to be more post up sometimes. And then sometimes, you know, coming off screens. If he does those type of things, I think you can really start to take them really seriously to uh, be more of not just a contender, but a threat to win. This portion is sponsored by 915 Carpet Cleaning. They take care of all of your needs, whether it's residential or commercial, whether it's flooring or carpet. 915 Carpet Cleaning, they get the job done. Look up 915 Carpet Cleaning. The carpet cleaner you know before you need one. All right, so next uh, I'm going to talk about Brittany Griner, BG. Brittany Griner uh, saw the, the Phoenix Mercury play uh, New York Liberty uh, last night. And Brittany's starting to look like she's back. I mean, I know she had, a, I think it was a toe fracture, something with her toe. So, you know, you got to think she, she had the whole thing with Russia, so she pretty much missed all of last year. Uh, you know, a lot of stuff going on for her. So this year, you know, she was hurt. Now she's, you know, she's playing, but it's like she's just trying to, you know, get back in shape and get back her feet and stuff. She's starting to look like she did when she was dominant. I mean, she's not going to be the same person because she's a little bit older and stuff, but 6'8", 6'9", is 6'8", 6'9". She can score. She blocks shots. She puts everybody in their natural position, right? And by putting them in their natural position, now their rotations are different. You know, their schemes are a lot different uh, offensively and defensively. Uh, yo, she was she was a problem. And, like, when she decided to, when they threw it into her and she posted up, you know, it's not much you can do with that height. So I look for Phoenix to really start to, you know, be a problem. I can't wait to see them uh, play uh, Chicago Sky to see her match up with Cardosa as well as Angel Reese. And when they play the Las Vegas Aces, I want to see her play against uh, Asia Wilson because, you know, Asia's the, she's, she's, she's that girl. She's that dude, right? So <clears throat> I think they're going to be very formidable with her health. Um with a healthy her, rather, they look different. They do. So I uh, can't wait to see what goes on as I continue. Now that basketball, see, the NBA is over. You know, I'm all in. I'm going to be all in the WNBA. I might try to uh, study or, or, or know at least one player from each team. I think that's going to try to be my goal. Maybe I'll try to name a player from each team next, next episode. That's what I need to try to do. Or at least – from the games I saw, I don't want to be naming people I ain't even seen them play, you know, just on there. But I'll, uh, I'll try to name one or two players from each team. All right, all right. Last thing is about the Lakers head coach search. Now, you know, I actually got a message and I, I, I told them I was going, you know, talk about it. Um, the Lakers head coaching search, you know, it's it's weird with with what's going on. A uh, question I got asked was, you know, why do you think they have a hard time uh, finding a coach? My sentiment is, you know, it's considered a dream job in a sense because it's the Lakers, but it's it's more of a headache job. You you if if you're gonna hire somebody there, you need to hire somebody with uh, championship pedigree, because realistically, LeBron is not gonna he's not gonna. He's really not going to uh, respect, in a sense, somebody who's, you know, doesn't have that pedigree because he he has four championships. So when you have somebody there that doesn't have that type of pedigree as a coach, he's going to kind of look at him and, and feel like I know more than you. Right. And And that's it's a feeling I have. But history has shown that's kind of how he is. Right. So he's been like that. Like when he was with the Heat, he wasn't respectful of uh, of Spolstra. Spolstra. Spolstra is now regarded as one of the one of the best coaches in the in the history. I mean, he still got more to go, but he's a 
that's considered a top coach. So if you're going to have somebody there, you know, I know it was they looked at Darren Hurley. Uh, they, they, they're they looking at J.J. Reddick, which is which is odd because J.J. doesn't have any coaching experience. Not saying he can't coach, but he doesn't have any experience. So it's going to be hard to, to get somebody there that they respect because – I don't think they operate the way most organizations do where, you know, the GM is in line with, with how everything is supposed to go with the coaches and stuff, the hierarchy that you see with most teams. Uh, the Lakers is kind of over the place because if the player, you know, is, is really close to the owner, you know, you kind of just go over the coach's head if you have problems. And then with social media, everybody sends out these subliminal messages. Um, I have no idea who the Lakers can get. And you think about it, whoever they get, they've had a history of getting rid of people, you know, really fast. You rarely have uh, somebody who's there for, for, you know, longer than three to five years. I mean, Phil, as good as he was, was I think Phil was only there four years, maybe five the first time. And then he comes back, and I think he was there for another two to two to four years, two to three years, or something like that. So you got to get somebody that's respected because a new coach uh, with no championship, you know, pedigree is going to be hard for those guys because you have to you have to get those guys to look you in your eye, and you have to be able to get on those guys, you know. And if you're not getting on them, uh, they're not paying attention to you, like. Look, Lou Lou helped LeBron win his first championship with with Cleveland. And Lou was re- well respected as an assistant coach. And what he did was he called LeBron out in in in, in film. Like, yo man, what what was what's that? Now I'm sure LeBron didn't like it, but but it's 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 number one is how you do it. You know, if you're you're an ass with how you call people out you know, it, it could rub people the wrong way. I've heard NBA players say that they had coaches that they would never call the uh, the, the best player out in meetings, but they they call a, a player who barely plays out for something that they did. So you know that they're not gonna, you know, you know who who they feel like they have to protect. But if you're the type of person that keeps everybody accountable, and and that's what Ty Lue was doing uh, in a certain way. It, it resonates, so it makes you, uh, you know, it, it makes your word become your word. So I right now, I, I know it's just breaking news earlier that Monty Williams got fired. I think he needs to take some time off. You know, he's he has some uh, family stuff, you know, with his wife, uh, uh, illness and stuff. So I would take that off at least a year and just get away from it all. I don't know who who you're going to get to to coach because you have you can't have somebody with such a strong personality that it's going to to me it's going to butt heads with those two guys because they feel like they're the Lakers franchise. I think this year you're going to see that that the Lakers need to go in a new direction and need to blow this team up after next year because they're not good enough with with the pieces around you can't have lebron be your best player lebron needs to be your second or third best player but this year he was still putting up really big numbers and he was still really good but when it came time for key games he doesn't seem to have it like he used to he seems to get a little bit more tired wear and tear so you need to kind of you know figure out who the hierarchy is I don't know what they're going to do because LeBron is real ball dominant. I don't know if he's going to be okay with just posting up or, or, or coming off the ball a little. I think he's going to want the ball in his hand. So we'll see. I, I, there's nobody that comes to mind right now off the top of my head that they, they should get. So uh, if they do get J.J., <laughs> it's going to be interesting because if he gets on him, then what is he going to say in that podcast that they do together? <laughs> Okay, now to my basketball ideology. You know, I do film breakdown, how how to do the things that I teach. How do the things that I teach translate in the games? I'm sitting up here reading and not even reading my own stuff right. So basically, you know, I try to take a scenario from a game 
and uh, I, you know, break it down and I break it down based on how I teach uh, and train when I'm when I'm training clients. There are, there are always more than one thing uh, or one more. There's always ugh, there's always more than one reason a team can win or lose. My goodness, it felt like I ain't, it felt like I ain't been on this been talking on on a show for for a long time the way I'm rambling through stuff. <laughs> Forgive me, y'all. So, you know, <clears throat> there's a there's always going to be more than one or two reasons why a game is won or lost. What I'm going to highlight <clears throat> today is something that I feel that I needed to point out because I thought it was key. Uh direct line drives. Now, what is a di- direct line drive? Direct line drive is when I catch the ball, defender is on me, and I either sweep or jab, but once I go right or once I go left, I just go, you know, two or three dribbles, and I'm at the basket finishing, okay? Uh, I don't make any kind of hesitation or counter moves, okay? It's just a straight drive. Put my head down, and I'm just going to the basket, okay? So that's what a direct line drive is. Now, I feel uh, if you watch the game, Boston attacked – the Mavs with a ton of direct line drives. They, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, they went at Luca and Kyrie uh, a ton of times. Now they did direct line drive against uh, Lively, Gafford, some of the other slower footed uh, Mav defenders, but it just seems like they were making a, a concerted effort to go after those two. And it was a lot of when the ball swings. Once it swings, they're catching the ball, and the defenses defender is is uh was in help, and now they're closing back out, and now they're just attacking them. So, um, <clears throat> this was a, a, a strategy of of the Celtics against the uh, Mavs, and it was working. It, it really was working. Now, what makes a direct line drive effective is that the defender. It's not able to make you counter move. If they're not able to make you counter move, it you get past them a lot easier. And that puts pressure on the other help that's trying to help. They might have to help uh, a split second sooner than they what they thought they were going to have to help because the driver gets by them easy, which throws off their timing. And, and now when the ball goes out, <clears throat> the rotation can be late, which, which can – lead to open shots that you know you didn't know you wanted to give so let let me delve into that just a little bit more defensively when you scheme against teams you say to yourself okay this is the shot we want to give up meaning we want a certain person to possibly take this shot right here so you rotate defensively and as you're rotating you're taking the ball away and you're allowing them to swing the ball to the person that you want to to shoot the ball because you feel they might not be as good shooting it. They have a lower percentage. So you let that person shoot. Now, if that person hits, you're probably going to live with that person knocking down shots uh, because you don't feel that person can, right? What I'm talking about is when you have to help faster than what you want it to. So now you're helping faster than what you want to. So now that rotation isn't as crisp and as decisive as what it should be because you're trying not to give the uh, corner three up, right? But because the direct line drive went faster than what, you know, he wasn't able to keep him out of the paint for more than, you know, a certain amount of seconds. I believe Jason Kidd wants wants Luca to to play good man-to-man D for at least two seconds. Right. So, he, you know, it gives people chance to be ready for it. So if he's not playing D for at least good two seconds and he's making letting those drives come easier. Now that guy who's on the uh, bottom side has to rotate probably faster than what he was expecting to, uh, to to rotate. Maybe they're trying to have the wing defender be the one to, to help out first. Right. So that ball gets skipped out to the to the to the wing and now the corner comes up now you get the ball to the corner and that corner shot is the corner shot you wanted well 
if the ball gets passed faster than what you you thought, maybe you have both the wing and the corner defender come up, you know, unexpectedly because they weren't expecting that drive to be. And now that ball goes to the to the wing for the shot. Or maybe it goes to the corner and now that wing out of like, wait a minute, I wasn't supposed to go, but I got to get out there now. Human nature as a defender. Now that ball gets shot up to the to the wing for for the person to shoot that you didn't want to shoot because that person can knock down the shot. So I think it's important to not have direct line drives defensively. I also think it's important to have direct line drives offensively because if you can, you you put tons of pressure uh, on uh, on the defense. Now, if you can make the the driver counter move. Counter moves, as effective as they are, they they tend to give you an extra second of of uh, of deciding or or you know how do I put it? A direct line drive, if it takes you from the three point line, I'm gonna try to use some some mathematics here. So if it's a direct line drive, I catch the ball from the from the top of the three, I immediately catch it in a uh, in a split foot. Uh, position and I sweep through and I take two dribbles and get to the basket right and let's say that takes me 1.5 seconds to execute from the time I catch to the time I shoot but then let's say I catch the ball and I go through the same move and I take the first dribble and the defender actually kind of cuts me off and I counter move. Let's say I counter move with a behind the back, spin, cross, whatever. I take a, a dribble, going to my left. Now I take another dribble and I still finish at the at the rim. But that took me 2.4 seconds. So even though I got by him and I was able to finish, the fact that it took me almost a complete second longer to get there should allow a defensive rotation. Now, if I'm getting to the basket after a counter move that took me a second longer and there ain't no help there, boy, y'all got, y'all got to deal with that defense because that rotation is slower. But I'm just trying to give you an example of what making somebody do a counter move can can kind of entail, all right, how the time it takes. It's not long. It's not long. It's not like it takes a lot of time. It's just a little bit, a little bit, slower to get you to the where you're trying to get because you're having to 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 not go direct line drive so um that's something that i do work on with clients you know direct line drives i also try to work with one counter move right or two counter moves I try to keep it simple because i want them to continue to put pressure on the defense and boston continually put pressure on mavs defense and the Mavs had a hard time with um, with trying to contain it because they were direct line driving and they were putting pressure on the first defender and then on the rotation defenders. There was constant pressure that whole game to try to make sure that you knew, you know, what you were going to do. And then the thing is, you don't know, you, you know, everybody can shoot. So it wasn't like, okay, we're going to let uh, – uh, we're going to make Derek White make threes. Man, Derek White makes them at a high clip. They all do. <clears throat> so that was a challenge that the Mavs faced, and, and it was an uphill battle. Uh, but, yeah, I just wanted to point that out. I'm not sure if I'll be – I'll probably still try to do some film breakdown now that I'm watching a WNBA. But, you know, I might move on to different things. Just depends on how I feel. Okay, next <clears> – <throat> I'm going to discuss how much arc do you truly need on your jump shot. Okay, so what is arc? Well, arc or arch. I think I actually say arch, but it should be arc. <laughs> but what I'm talking about is when you when you when you shoot jump shots or when you're shooting, you know, where you're if you're right-handed and you release the ball and you follow through where you're um arm is positioned after you shoot the ball now if your hand is if we're looking at it here i go uh mathematically if you're looking at it from an isosceles triangle no <laughs> if you're looking at it from points if i'm standing straight up and my hand is going straight straight up 
my body, that would be considered a 90 degree angle, right? If my hand is straightforward, flat, then it would be considered uh, a zero degree angle. So when you're shooting a jump shot, you typically want to be at a 45 degree angle, okay? No, I'm sorry. If my hand is straight, it's not at zero. It's at 30. It should be at 30. Yeah. Yeah, because it's 360. Yeah, okay. I don't, know. I don't know. I'm tripping. All right, so straight ahead. But let me let me get out of there because, you know, sometimes my math was, was mathless. <laughs> but in any case, straight above my head is 90 degree. I want my hand to be, my, my follow through to be at a 45 degree angle, okay? There are some people that shoot and you can tell their follow through is somewhere between 25 and 30 or 25 and 35 degrees because it's more in front of them. There are some people that shoot and their shot is almost at 90 degree angle. 45 is probably where you want your follow through to be. It provides proper arc. You, you get an opportunity to see the ball have a little bit of air up under it where it goes up and comes down almost like a rainbow. If your shot is under 45, you're going to notice that it's what you call flat meaning there's no arc on it when the ball hits the rim it's usually going to hit the front of the rim or the back of the rim or it goes like straight through at an angle so if it hits the back of the rim or the front it's always going to bounce back it won't bounce up uh, when you have that now i've had people that i've seen i've trained clients who have that type of shot and yes, you, you can tell when it's when it's a flat shot. OK, when it's higher than 45, you know, close to 90, you have where shots are either hitting all net or they miss a lot. You rarely have shots. Now, I'm not going to say rarely. You, you still will have shots that will hit the hit the rim, bounce up because it's coming straight down. Uh, having proper arc on your shot is really important. It allows you to be um, more consistent. So you want to practice having a 45 degree angle on your arc when, you, when you're following through. Okay, so just make sure you practice having your, your hand at more, more 45 degree angle. And you'll, you'll see it because when you look at, you know, most players, most people who shoot, You'll tell you can tell who has proper art. Now it doesn't mean that if you're not shooting at a 45 degree angle, you're not going to be a sh good shooter. I I just tend to say shooting with a 45 degree angle will allow more touch and opportunities if the ball doesn't immediately go in. Right, you have a greater chance that that ball is going to bounce up, hit the rim, and stuff, so on and so forth. So just uh, work on your arc. And give yourself an opportunity to see if where you are shooting your arc, if it works for you or if you need to uh, adjust it. And it's more just clearing my. Like I can't, there is getting, I got to take the mucinex. I don't want to take it too early. Mm. I should have got some, what's that stuff called? The, for my, for your sinuses. No. no, the uh, decongestant. But I think that has a decongestant. Okay, last one. I'm ready. All right, so last thing I'm going to talk about is teaching kids how to play the post. Uh, I feel it's very important to keep, teach my kids how to play the post. It helps with their footwork. And what I have noticed is by teaching them the post, I can start to make kids that aren't aggressive start to be a little bit more aggressive because they have to, you know, push up against someone when they're dribbling or they have to try to hold them off you know, and use their, their body and their foot position 
to do so. Uh, I teach the post. Obviously, you got to teach it, you know, with the footwork, turning and facing, drop steps, you know, the simple, simple moves, uh, and then how to use counters. Uh, when you're teaching the post, it does help your footwork if you teach it properly, you know, and uh, I think when you teach someone who's a guard how to play the post with footwork, it, they can become so, so uh hard to guard because of their footwork and they can post you up and back you down uh it's similar to maybe teaching a post player who who can has guard skills how to you know counter move and drive and stuff out on the perimeter so it, it teaching the post is something that um every player needs to have because what happens in in the game of basketball is when you start playing against elite players and elite, you know, teams, they understand how to get what they want. And if they understand that you're a small person, <laughs> you're really small on the court, you're short, they're going to try to, you know, get mismatches where they're posting you up. Look, speaking from a very small, tall person <laughs> myself, I, you know, I had to guard taller guys, but you know they they couldn't back me down which was the thing that I noticed noticed I I you know I I had to I was always wanting to be stronger and and I love playing you know defense in the post in the sense that when I was growing up we used to play you know games where uh basketball games where you had to just you're in the post and you're just trying to you know back your guy down and score and everybody was prideful and and very competitive so you know you had sore shoulders from, you know, uh, bopping up against the guy who was guarding you. And, and that kind of stuff taught me how to have leverage. Because if you're doing that against, you know, somebody who's grown and outweighs you, they're going to move you every time. So, um, I, you know, as you get older, you get switched or something and you're guarding somebody taller and they're trying to back you down. The first thing I was was like, OK, well. He's not going to be able to move me. So he's gonna, if he's going to try to back me down, he's not going to be able to back me down. He's going to ultimately have to turn and shoot over me. Which, I mean, if you're, you're six, six, five, six, seven, that shouldn't be a problem, right? But my job was to eliminate you from backing me down, okay? So it's a very effective tool when it comes to uh, trying to get players to be able to to not uh, play so so scary, so timid. You have to kind of man up when you're playing in the post. The footwork that you learn from playing in the post is is so usable. It will help you in, in more ways than what you think it will to be able to play defense as well as offense. And it's not just about turn around, I'm just going to back you down and go up over you. It's the skill involved with, you know, turning, using your hips, using your jump stop, faking one way, turning, and and giving somebody one option and thinking that you're going to do one thing, but then you're actually going to do a next you know, and the funny part is, well, man, you ain't no, you ain't no post up player. How can you, how can you teach uh, post work? I was like, it's easy. I mean, it's you know, it's easy to teach post work because it's really post post work is more about footwork and uh, strength. If you can have those two things, I feel like you'll be successful uh, playing in the post. So uh, make sure that you're learning how to play in the post because it will help your game. Okay, so that's going to be all the time I have for today. Uh, always make sure that you like, subscribe, follow, comment. Uh, hey, and if you have a, a a Juneteenth story, you know, that maybe one of your, you know, great uncles or dads or somebody told you, you know, that was passed down, you know, share it with me. Uh, I'd love to hear it. I mean, I have other stories uh, but yeah, no, nah, that, that, it, that story. And like I say, I'm laughing because not, I'm not, I don't, I wasn't laughing because it was funny. I was laughing because it was fucked up. It's like, yo, man, can you believe that, you know, people pro actually did this? It's just crazy. So, uh, I hope, you know, most of you celebrate it. I, I think everybody should celebrate it. 
And I think we should look to learn uh, more about each other. I mean, I, and I know not everything we learn is going to be things that we're proud of, but I think we should at least learn so we at least understand, you know, and understand our history. Because, you know, if it wasn't for the history, if it wasn't for our history, we would not be where we are now. That That's real. Because if we didn't know what our history was, we would think a lot of the stuff that went on was okay, you know, back back in the day. So, uh, yeah, you know, celebrate it. Celebrate all the different, you know, holidays we have. You know, and appreciate it. I know a lot of people, you know, will disparage, you know, the country in certain ways. But when you look at other places, like, man, they they, they don't play. So, you know, there's a lot of things we, we not everything, but there, there, are some, there are a lot of things that, you know, you you, you probably don't understand uh, helps being here than it does in other places. But... I always tell people, man, if you if if you feel that strongly about it, won't you just go ahead and 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 go on over there where you want to go, you know, and see see how it is, see if if it's that good, then maybe I might come over there and join you. But I know sometimes you go and you be like, yo, okay, nah, they they, they just m- must make it look good for those tourist destinations, but it's not like that. <laughs> All right, so uh, we're going to end today's segment. I'm going to end it like I always do. If it was easy, everyone would be doing it. I'm out. Street cred sports, say it with your chest. Yeah, yeah. Go get it from the net. Street cred sports, okay, that's a bet. 